um, Holly is Head of Communication and Campaigns in Citizens Advice. And obviously, um, we're, we're delighted that Holly has made the journey up today because um, we work very closely in partnership with Citizens Advice on their support through um, local, local people on the ground locally, um, Hannah and her colleagues. Um, it's invaluable in the work we do. So. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Holly coming to see us today. Thanks very much, Carol. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you particularly for welcoming me and inviting me this, um, today to celebrate 75 years of campaigning, because sometimes that's not always the thing that we celebrate when we think about the first 75 years of citizens' advice, because this is probably a photograph that's quite um, familiar to many people inside citizens' advice, it was the first time we decided to be able to use any possible platform available in order to be able to reach out to everybody. So we got <coughs> that the course box. Now, this is the photograph we tend to use to remind ourselves quite how far we've come in the, 13, in the 75 years since 1939 when we opened up, um, almost as a sort of civil wing of the war effort um, back in 1939 dealing with initially evacuation and then bombings and homelessness as a result of that and ration books. And right from the start, we were the people who were not only sorting out individual problems, but seeing when there were big problems that needed to be sorted out on a big scale. And when, we, when I use this slide and ask people what it is that um, for, motivates them to get involved in citizens' advice, um, I could ask anybody here, because almost everybody here has got some kind of connection with it, what's the reason you think of when you think of why you've chosen to get, get involved in citizens' advice? Anyone? To make a difference. To, make a difference. to, um, to obtain information and knowledge and intellectual stimulation. Yes. Yeah. Pretty much, wherever I go, whoever I ask who's involved in citizens' advice, those are the answers. So we've been going for 75 years, and there's one reason why we do this, to make a difference and to get answers. So that's why um, our twin aim, not only of giving advice, but also advocating and for change is so important. Now, one of the things I'd like to say a bit about myself, because coming to York um, is a particularly poignant moment for me because one of the first places I used to hang out in citizens' advice waiting rooms as a junior reporter was when I was working for Radio York. And I got bustled out of the uh, waiting room on several occasions until I worked out there was another way of getting case studies other than hassling people in waiting rooms. Um, but that is one of that book, but it's a, it's a good example of how citizens' advice has got better at telling its stories because back then it was really hard to be able, because of the, the um, pressures we had with the, um, the um, focus we have on anonymity and protecting people's identity, it was really hard for a journalist like me who actually wanted to tell the stories of injustice to be able to get the stories that I needed. And we're significantly better at that now. But there's also another reason why systems advice is so important to me, because I didn't start off as a journalist, I didn't start off my relationship with systems advice as a campaigner, I started off as a client. Because a long time ago, when my housing benefit didn't come through, I got myself into a financial pickle and I had to sort it out by going to systems advice. Now I'm not saying I would have been the first person to be able to say publicly after that that systems advice had helped me and been a great advocate for the service apart from possibly privately to my family. But one of the reasons why I was so proud to be able to come back and work for Citizens Advice is because they had helped me a long time ago. You think about the fact that two million people every year, face to face, get that kind of help. Think about the depth and breadth of people who can advocate on our behalf for what we do. We've never stopped campaigning right back from, from that call to box to now. I've got a couple of examples up here. The lady in the middle is particularly elegant, and I wanted to use her to remind us that we haven't been doing consumer campaigning for a short amount of time, we've been doing it for a very long amount of time. Because when higher purchase agreements came in in the 1950s, we were the ones who spotted there was a problem. Because people were getting themselves into a bit of a financial muddle, not understanding exactly the kind of agreements they were signing up to, and people were, were putting together higher purchase agreements 
arguably deliberately, in order to make sure that people got themselves into a muddle and they could take more money off them than they were actually entitled to. We've also campaigned, significantly less successfully, I would argue, sometimes, for things like, um, for, uh, against the closure of things like the post office. And this is one of the things I want to, us to think about a bit today, because we are almost unique in campaigning organisations in that our funding is from the public purse. And when you are using public money in order to be able to campaign, you have to be really, really sure you're making that money work. And I feel particularly passionate that if we're, making, uh, if we're campaigning, I need to know that clients are going to have a benefit out of the end of it. And that's why I'm particularly proud about this one. It might have Shelter's name on it, but it's most particularly got ours. That took 10 years to get through the protection of tenants' deposits. And anybody now in, in a bureau will know the difference that that makes. We don't stop campaigning about tenancies. We don't stop campaigning about private rental sector because we know that sometimes those things take longer than others. And this is another good example of how sometimes we have to be able to pick our battles. Most of you will have been involved at some point in our relentless bid for proper regulation of bailiffs. We have indeed spent decades on this. We have, in our campaign materials, a timeline of shame. Now the shame is not on us, it's on the people who had the choices to make regulation happen and chose not to. We now have a good practice protocol initially adopted in 2009, and now, finally, um, you have the opportunity to be able to press all of your local authorities to check whether they're actually using it and see whether their standards stand up to it. But we've still got questions about accountability. We've still got questions about enforcement. We've still got questions about really whether anyone who has that decision-making power will finally regulate an industry that ultimately is still working within Victorian standards. And we need to be very clear. I was at a Merseyside. I was at the Merseyside Research and Campaigns Cluster meeting yesterday, where um, an, an, an incident involving a bailiff and a pregnant tenant was so outrageous. And I was thinking about this protocol, and I was thinking about how long we fought for that. And there are still situations where a, a bureau has to go to the local authority and and the um, the employer of that bailiff and say this is not acceptable. Now we're still not in <coughs> a place where we'd like to be. So we need to be making sure that we're picking our battles carefully. This is a very, very successful recent campaign, and I know people in Bureau will say, well, about time, because we told you about this, and you didn't get on with it fast enough, and I would say, yes, we didn't get on with it fast enough, but when we did get on with it fast enough, boy, were we good at it. And you know why? Because everybody really, really cared about it. There was an opportunity to be able to change things. People in power had decided that they needed to be able to do something partly because people like us had embarrassed them to changing things. So we've now got new rules for payday lenders, we've got closer monitoring from the Financial Conduct Authority. When an organisation like that changes its name, or the person at the top, that's normally an opportunity to get in there, because they'll be starting to change their strategy. And we were there at the right time. A cap on the total cost of credit, something that initially we weren't campaigning for, other people were, the government took some notice, let's see how that actually works out. And the advertising practices under the microscope. This is something that we particularly got involved in, and I'll tell you why. Because we are about empowering our, our clients, not simply telling them what to do. And when adverts were misleading people, there was a really good argument for saying we should be giving people, the people should be able to make choices on the basis of facts, not on the basis of, people, of being deeply misled. We worked with the Advertising Standards Authority because actually we hadn't done that before. No one had actually gone to the Advertising Standards Authority and said, how do we make sure that these complaints work? And out of the seven complaints, I think Hannah might correct me on this, but I think of the seven complaints that we put in for the Advertising Standards Authority, four of them have been upheld. That's pretty good going. And we may well be able to get more um, as things go on. Now that means that 10 million consumers are better off this year if they are taking out payday, loan, payday loans than they were last year. They never came near a bureau, most of those people, and they're better off because of what we did. So, that's the impact. The approach 
is um, a wide range of things, and this is this is part of the important aspect of making sure that we campaign in our in a unique way because of the, the unique character of our organisation. We did lots of that um, uh, con that awareness raising through the newspapers, um, and that was also based on the evidence that you provided. We made sure that we raised the awareness of people through a um, through a film, an animation that we shared. And that, that ended up being shared, and you managed to promote local authorities to be able to put that up in their areas as well. So people were able to see why they should make, be making cleverer choices about, their, about getting credit. And the poster at the end, Are You Mad About the Ad? Promoting the idea that people were entitled to have decent information rather than misleading information. And the quote I've got from Flincher CAB is important, because this was a, a campaign that we developed from the network, with the network, and meant that everybody within the network was able to do something. When we work together, we can make that kind of difference. Now, Liz is one of my particular favourites in the payday lending campaign, because Liz started off as a victim and became a client. She came in because she got herself into a pickle over a, over a payday loan because the, the credit checks had not been substantial enough. She'd been able to mislead on her form and then found out afterwards that she was in a place where she couldn't pay back. But she didn't stay as a victim. And this is one of the things I think is important about our language when we talk about clients and case studies. She effectively became a campaigner. She not only featured in a film that we had within Citizen Advice, which we used and promoted across um, any of our campaigning activity, she ended up on Newsnight. Wonga had to answer to Liz. So let's remember when we talk about giving voice to people, what is absolutely extraordinary about our ability to be able to empower people, to tell people who have power where they really should be changing things. And this means we've translated this into other campaigns. Our Fit for Work campaign, which many people will know about, ch challenging issues around charging for medical evidence that is happening um, by GPs and other health workers, the issues around mandatory reconsideration, people ending up without any money while they're appealing, and the fact that um, the replacement for the ATOS contract needs to be much stricter and better delivered than it has been up until now. Who are the best people to tell the stories of how awful that mandatory reconsideration is? The people who experience it. I'll be quite honest with you, I've read a lot of the kind of case studies that um, we, we write down in the Bureau, and sometimes we suck out the passion that's actually in the stories that ourselves and that we feel. Um, and so we wanted to put some of that passion back. So although we need to maintain that, the, the, the protection of everybody's identity, making sure that people could tell their own stories on a blog meant that we had a hundred stories within a month of people who are happy to tell the story about how they felt um, uh, the ESA wasn't working for them and how they felt as a consequence. That meant that we could create a petition, which wasn't just being signed by people who had um, suffered the injustice, but people who felt the injustice beyond that. We don't make as much as we possibly could do of our supporters, those people who may never be an advisor, but who broadly speaking think that citizens' advice is a good idea, is a good thing. And remember, we're a much larger national institution. It's been hanging around for 75 years. There's a lot of those people. Let's make sure they can all help when we are campaigning on things like this. Then we've been able to tweet about it. Now, I don't know how many people here are on Twitter, but we ended up with 300,000 people tweeting about mandatory reconsideration just this week because it's a year old. That's 300,000 um, uh, people on social media saying that mandatory reconsideration as it currently exists and works, is not helping people who need help. And this is the way that ultimately all of that very clever evidence that you managed to gather in Bureau turns into material which means that we can communicate with the people who make decisions. <coughs> now I know there is a tendency to think that decision makers are really, really clever and that they have lots of time on their hands. But to be honest, the most important thing to do is to have your argument on one piece of paper in very short sentences with very, very simple words. And this is what we did. This is a summary of our campaign here, the Fit for Work campaign summary, which we were able to present to MPs, um, DWP of, um, managers and so forth. And on the other side, the specific evidence that people had given. So we were able to simplify things down. 
And I know you'll expect me to say this as a former journalist, but simplify, simplify, simplify is probably the best thing you can possibly do when you come to campaigning. The brilliant thing about this campaign is that not only are we badgering those people who've got decisions, but we are creating empowering materials for clients to be able to make sure that the system works for them and that they know the law that they've got, that they know the, their rights they've got under the law. We have managed to create a reasonable adjustments guide, which is not only available for advisors, but also has, a, has an option for clients as well. So that when they are, in, and partners, if you want to share it with partners, it's also available. So that when people say, hang on a minute, I don't think they're using this, they're treating me properly because I've got a disability. This is material that they can do a checklist and then go to the people who quite often will not be giving them entirely the full story and say, you know what, I'm entitled to have a change in the time of my appointment because of, of, because of my disability. You are, you are obliged to consider my disability when making those kind of decisions. And at the far end, a decision tree so that both clients and advisors can work through together how we make sure that, that the reasonable adjustments which um, are part of the Equality Act are actually applied to the people who need it. And then this is when we get to the, to the, to the decision makers. Um, there's lots of different ways we can do this. I've used the picture here of um, an MP called Sheila Gilmore. Now she's standing in front of a pull up of another um, cam uh, campaign and another charity. I don't care. You know what? She's campaigning about mandatory reconsideration. We found out that she cared about these things just as much as we did. And rather than just writing to an MP and saying, do you agree with us? We got her to do something which MPs can do, which we can't, which is table questions in the House of Commons. So she managed to get material and information out of the government about mandatory reconsideration that we couldn't. So we turned somebody who could possibly have just been somebody who would say, yes, I agree with you, into an ally. And, amazingly, we did this with the Select Committee too. Our evidence was submitted to the Select Committee and they used it in an extensive, extensively in their report about mandatory reconsideration. And there were good reasons why I'll explain, I'll explain later about why that is important. Because sometimes those reports can get shelved, but sometimes those reports are the things that end up people, uh, start paying people attention. And at the, at the far end, we have a picture which is more about wishful thinking at the moment than anything else, is that possibly at some point David Cameron might admit that mandatory reconsideration as it currently uh, stands isn't working for people. Now, this is a little bit of a boost for our, our local people here because um, here we have the York Bureau winning their award at Systems Advice Annual Conference this year, and on the other side, a really significant and helpful um, report Come, uh, put together by uh, Citizens Advice North Yorkshire in York about, citizen, about universal credit and digital by default. Now why do I put those two things up there? Because we can spend a lot of our time thinking that everything needs to go through Westminster. Or you can identify, you can get things done locally too. And the important thing about access denied is that digital by default might be a national policy, but sometimes there are local solutions. And if you bang on enough about, about this kind of thing, to the people who've got the opportunity to make those decisions locally, you can get it onto their agenda and hopefully change the, way, the policies and practices that affect people's lives. So, we have to think about what it is that makes us special when we campaign for systems advice. And these are the things that we've worked out really make us unique. Our evidence, as you would expect. Our trusted and authoritative brand, no one really is quite like us in terms of having been around for 75 years, having that robustness about the evidence, and therefore being able to be uh, taken seriously when we come up with a particular complaint. Our problem-solving approach, we're pretty practical. There are some campaigners who are less so. And that's why we can be really clear and proud of our particular approach. And our reasonable tone. Frankly, we are here to ruffle feathers. We will ruffle feathers, and sometimes we're more annoying because we're reasonable. Because it's so much more difficult to say no when somebody is saying it in a reasonable tone, and what we're asking for is ultimately reasonable. Our reach and insight with clients is almost unparalleled because of the number of clients that we have, but also because of the way that we approach their problems in a holistic manner. 
We don't just see somebody who's got a debt problem, we see somebody in the, in the round and the impact that debt problem might have on other aspects of their lives. And that means that we are really good at explaining to decision makers, big decision makers, how actually ordinary people make decisions. And that really, really helps with them um, to make their, their policies work for people rather than trying to crowbar people into systems that don't work. Our supporters and our volunteers, we have 22,000 roughly volunteers at any given time. I literally have no idea how many alumni we have. Do you? How many people used to work at your bureau over years? How many of those undergraduate law students are now working somewhere really swanky? Or are QCs? Um, and we are keeping track of them. So we know we need to do much more about that. But those supporters, those, those tweeters, those social ca media campaigners, of which we have thousands now, are able to support us in really simple uh, ways. We are able to send um, an email to our social media campaigners once a month saying, if you've got 10 seconds, can you tweet this? If you've got 10 minutes, can you write this? And those are people who will never, ever, ever be an advisor. But because they broadly speaking believe in what we do and they want to help us, they also help, us connect, they also help to connect us to a wider network of people who believe in the kind of sense of justice that we have. And our relationship with decision makers. Because that feather ruffling is really important. It means also that because of our authoritative tone, because of our evidence, because we're reasonable, we get in and talk to people, which means that we can do a lot more than some people, some other campaigners may not. Now, I've put this slide in because it's just a reminder <coughs> that one of the reasons why we're changing the name from social policy to research and campaigns is because it's much clearer about what we do and it reflects more widely our focus in terms of being, uh, of, of being on the side of citizens. Because power doesn't just lie in the public sector or in directly elected representatives. We know more and more that power lies in corporations. This morning, one of, our, one of the uh, things that I found on our top news email that we get every morning about where citizens' advice is featured is the number of complaints to Scottish Power that people have been making. Now, Scottish Power need to be accountable. Simply because they're not elected doesn't mean they don't need to be accountable. So we're as important, interested in better companies and better conduct of companies as we are in better government. So in the future, we have a number of things that we're doing to campaign for change. And again, this sort of reflects that breadth of what we do and what we care about. Our current campaigns include the fair pay for prepay. A really good example of how when a moment comes up, you really want to grasp it. There has been a number of injustices for prepay, uh, prepayment users for a number of years. And it's been very difficult to get decision makers to take any notice. They'll always come up with a reason why it's too much. But now we've got smart meter rollout coming along, we've got an opportunity to say, this is the time when if you're going to roll out smart meters, the benefits of smart meters have to come to those people who have been done over by having a, uh, effectively a meter in their house, which they have been rationing themselves with for some time, as soon as possible. Um, our advice for the future campaign is as much to do with reminding people that free advice is an, in, an essential part of a free and decent society as anything. And we will need to continue to press for that because, well, well austerity doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon. The importance of what we do needs to be pressed on the, those who have the opportunity to make those decisions. Our Fit for Work campaign that we talked about, well, we are seeing opportunities coming up even uh, at, um, as we speak to be able to press even further for change. And we're also exploring the possibility of doing a campaign as much to do with awareness raising as anything else on domestic and financial abuse. Because one of the things that's unique about us is that we know and understand when, uh, about, uh, about uh, people's financial situations because we deal so much with money and debt. We also, because of the case work, that, because of the um, research that we've been doing about asking people about their, um, their domestic situations in relation to uh, gender-based violence, we have now got a great insight into quite how much there is out there. And we think that this is one of those things where we have a unique perspective, where we could raise people's awareness 
of, what, of the impact that this has on our society. And that would be really exciting and something that will be really unique to us. We're also developing some work around housing, which is at this, at this stage um, in, the research pro in the research stage, but we will want to look much further, um, look much more at exactly what the kind of housing solutions we need. Because one of the problems is that almost all politicians want one big silver bullet when it comes to housing, and yet that never quite works. And that's because we need to have local solutions, and that's why the, um, the, specific, the, the um, power of Bureau to be able to um, give us that, in, that insight will help. And I've got those question marks because we never stop. And we're always asking. And our cluster group yesterday in Merseyside was talking further about the impact of sanctions on people and whether we should perhaps be exploring how much people end up having to rely on their families before they finally come to us um, and need a food voucher. How much of that community resilience is one of the things that the politicians call it, where actually it's called sofa surfing at your mum's, and how long that really is acceptable before somebody finds themselves at the end of their tether. So there is so much more that we can do, but I hope you will find that it's a useful way of celebrating not only what we've done in the past, but most, most importantly, what we'll do in the next 75 years in terms of campaigning. Thank you very much. Um, I want to just ask a tiny bit of detail. Um, I'm assuming domestic financial abuse includes elder. Yes, we are looking at that as well. Yeah. Um, and being a housing, to and it. being a housing lawyer on the defence side, I don't listen to that. <laughs> that shouldn't be big to them. Um, the um, about what I, I think very strongly, there's a really there needs to be a really a strong national campaign uh, about the regulation of private landlords. I think that's a huge area. Yeah. Um, we are scoping our, our um, uh, financial abuse campaign really carefully because we're aware that, that there is the elder aspect of it as well. And we want to make sure that we get it right, but also that it's clear about what we think we, we can raise awareness of in one particular way. So it would be useful to be able to have more of your insight into what we should be and how we should be doing that. And we put you in touch with our research people about that. Okay, I'm not great on the other thing that we don't know at all, but I am. I do have some very firm views on private capital. <laughs> well, well, I was going to say, the, private, the, the, the housing um, uh, research that we're doing at the moment is trying to work, uh, is doing it over a number of bureaus who have got very, very different sort of local housing economies. And we did some work at our annual conference uh, through a workshop on what exactly were the things that were unique to people's environment and what was general and universal because we actually initially presented it from a London Bureau. And normally if you present from London Bureau, well, it's, well, it's fine, but it's still very well for you, that's London, it's very different here. That was precisely where we wanted to start, because as soon as you understand what's different, you also get an opportunity to understand the commonalities. And what we found was that a large number of you are now working with local authorities who have some sort of responsible private rented landlord register, but have pretty much zero confidence in the register making any difference. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work out, amongst other things, how much the regulation of, this, of the sector, or what constitutes the regulation that will be successful, where things are working and where things aren't, how much it is about provision, how much it is about empowerment of tenants to know their rights, and so forth. So we've got to try and, because it's about accessibility, it's about security, it's about supply, it's about affordability. And all of those, those four aspects sort of create different scenarios in different sorts of communities. And we need to work out that we're going to create a menu of recommendations for anybody who's got power that we're not putting a one-size-fits-all on, but that we have got things. Well, you know, if you have a high amount of private rented, then you should be considering these things in order to be able to ameliorate some of the problems that we have, we have identified, happen to tend to be around <coughs> if you've got a high, rent, high number of private rented, for example. Also, it depends on the demographics. You know, Blackpool's got loads of high, high rented, so has Enfield. Blackpool, Blackpool's got very different demographics from Enfield, and so that has an impact on what, what happens. Hello, I'm, I'm Melanie Davis. I'm currently managing Selby CAB. It, it, it's really um, just getting the, the, the CITE viewpoint Many of us got funding through the Advice Service Transition Fund yeah. and as part of that many of us are looking to broaden social policy and I'm glad we're calling it campaigning now. 
um, to those other agencies who are coming into those local networks. And, and I know we've got at least one person here today from a, another organisation who's part of our network. Um, and it, it's really, um, and that was one of the brilliant things about Access Denied as well, in that we were able to give those questionnaires to other agencies, get that data, collate it, feed it back to them so they can use it, but we, it also added strength. And I mean, there's just so much strength in that. How does CITA see itself, you know, maybe being able to support that a bit more in the future? Because the ASDF funding's only two years. We'll try and get some more, but we might not. Um, but I just think that's such a valuable part of it that we don't want to lose. I think you're right about partnership working. Um, I can't guarantee any extra money to follow on from ASTF, as you can imagine. Um, but we are trying to work out what is the best sort of approach for partnership working on campaigns for us nationally as, a, as well as locally. Because I'll be honest with you, sometimes we sort of hand out our brand a, a little bit too easily. People have come to us quite late in the day on a campaign and said, oh, will you sign up? Will you sign this letter? Because it's going to the telegraph tomorrow. And I've been quite firm about it. I said, our brand's amazing. We're awesome. There's 75 years of campaigning behind us. We're not just like, signing our signature away like that. We, if we're, unless we're involved early on, strategically, in the outcomes that we want to achieve, and understand those and see those things as being consistent with our values and our character as an organisation, then we're going to be much more cagey about it. So I think that's the sort of approach that I would recommend locally as well. Because you are, in some ways, in, in any given community, you've got a certain amount of strength. Remember what that strength means, and you can use it gently, which is particularly important in order to be able to bring people in and get those allies. I don't think Sheila Gilmore would have necessarily done that if we'd been bullying her. It's our reasonable tone that meant, as well as our trusted brand and so forth, that meant she said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll put the questions down for you. So in terms of building relationships and, the, and, and those alliances. I'm particularly excited, I want to go to the masterclass on, on, um, on influencing locally. So I want, to, I want to see how and explore that particularly, because I think that's really important. We've got a lot of that sort of capital. How we use it is, 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 um, is the one of the things I think we need to explore further so that we're making the most of it. Sorry, so it's no money. It's no, no, it's not about money. It's really just Sorry. about not losing that impetus. That we're yeah. getting other people who've never done that work interested in it yeah. and sharing the data, which is for the benefit of all our clients. Yeah. And that's what, what, that's what we need to support. And I'll be quite ruthless about this, even you know, in an open meeting like this. We're not going to suddenly start sharing how we do this stuff. We might do it for a particular campaign because we want to gather the, the information. But one of the things that is unique to us is our evidence. So we're going to make sure that that's still unique to us as an organisation. Do you know what I mean? So that, 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 but that's some of the hard work we've got to play. You know, it's our data, it's our data. We share it for when, we, when, it, when we're going to be able to win something for our clients, or we're going to win something for ourselves.